the things that's happened in the last few years with uh, the COVID is we haven't been able to have quite as many guest speakers as we would like. And uh, today's guest speaker, actually, had, we had to postpone, I think, three times. And this is the fourth attempt to get him here. Almost was going to be... Uh, uh, postponed again, but no, we fought through and said, no, we're going with it. And uh, it's great to have Pastor Kim Price here with us. It's actually very significant for us as a church because Pastor Kim was a minister who came and inducted our senior pastors back in 1992. And Pastor Kim had a lot to do with what Andrew mentioned there about the troubles that were happening uh, through the 80s and helping uh, this church get back on its feet, appointing Rick, and then uh, being involved in Pastor Aliafi's appointment as well. And um, it's, it's also very special today because a, a unique thing is happening because Pastor Kim is wearing a tie. And um, ties are cool, exhibit A. And um, I think the last time Pastor Kim wore a tie, he was probably at Pastor Eliaf's induction. So why don't we give him a hand as he comes to share the word with us this morning. Good morning. Yeah, I am wearing a tie. It only comes out, comes out for weddings, funerals, and very special occasions. And, uh, and I do believe it's a special occasion to honour uh, Pastors Eliafi and Fia today. And um, so it came out. And uh, don't I look cool? <laughs> Thank you, young lady. Got May God bless you with everything you need from your parents. All right. You, you didn't know I saw that, did you? My eyes still work, I think. <laughs> uh, it's a great joy to be with you today and to um, uh, share on 30 years uh, in this church. And uh, we know that prior to this, <clears throat> Iliafi and Fia were in Mangaweka, and I used to visit there and preach there. And... Um, on Friday, I just uh, shared some thoughts um, uh, that I've observed in their life, and I love their consistency. I love the stability. Uh, that story Andrew told there um, uh, about him getting up out of church and doing a pastoral visit, uh, that, that doesn't surprise me at all. Um, at, um, uh, you know, kind of just sensing God wants you to do something and you do it and somehow in the whole gathering uh, of the church you can accommodate those. We, sometimes uh, we, we, we create traditions. We really do. Um, and um, uh, some traditions are good. Schedules are good. But sometimes we can get pushed into a cocoon and uh, we've got to come out and we've got to get a little bit of butterfly uh, mentality and l learn to fly around a bit. Ever try to catch a monarch butterfly? I, I do a bit of photography and I try to get photos of them. Boy, they're a nuisance. And uh, when they land, they're great, but I like to get them flying. And uh, you can spend hours and hours trying to do that. I love uh, the desire to heed and hear the voice of the Spirit, and uh, without throwing the baby out with the bathwater, respond to opportunities and needs. Well, Pastor Eliafi, Pastor Fear, they are those type of people. Amen. Uh, they they love to hear what God is saying, and uh, and respond. Uh, today, <clears throat> I will not talk forever, but I will talk for half forever. Um, <laughs> but. Um, the, uh, I, today I, I wanted to pick up a little bit about uh, Pastor Eliafi and Fia's uh, 30 years and uh, the type of investments that we need to recollect today and reaffirm in our hearts as we move into the future. Um, I have told you every time I've been here that I'm writing a book. It's getting to the end. It's first three chapters have been edited by the editor. Uh, when I read the first chapter, you wouldn't believe it. I was so excited. I wonder who the person was. The editors can do some marvellous things to your writing. My editor told me, as well as my wife, said that my writing's a bit clunky. Uh, what I mean by that is being more mathematical and more analytical, I just put the facts down, make sure the skeleton's there and forget about the flesh and blood. Uh, but the writers, editors, they put all that stuff in and it makes it sound quite good. Uh, but uh, we are moving on uh, in, in getting that done. But in doing that, 
one of my subjects uh, in my book is the life of Paul, and I've laying my testimony over it as learnings for today. And uh, one thing about the Apostle Paul is uh, he got converted. He's about 28 years of age when he got converted. And um, he's writing a letter to Timothy. And I'm going to read from Timothy in a moment. And Timothy's a young man that he is writing to, but it's 30 years later. And I picked up on the 30 years and kind of thought, okay, Paul got saved on the Damascus Road, supernatural encounter with Jesus. And uh, then 20 years later, he takes into discipleship Timothy. And uh, then 30 years after his conversion, uh, he writes to Timothy in 1 Timothy. And I, I kind of thought, okay, we've got 30 years uh, of ministry in this church. We know we can add nine years uh, at Mangaweka and years before that in Christ Church, but I'm just taking the 30 years, all right? And, um, and so we, we look at it there, and, and I start thinking, well, what was Paul? Is he starting to move? I was a little bit offended by that statement, you know. Well, what was it, um, the 60s and 70s are your best years? Ah, <laughs> oh, I'm working on the 75 to 90 group. <laughs> oh, a bit of God. I don't know what years they are. Yeah. They're whatever you make of them, amen? And I've just convinced I'm not ready to die yet. All right. It could happen, but who cares? I'm going to be with Jesus. All right. Um, but in 2 Timothy, flicking over, which was written a little bit later to 1 Timothy, but I want to just pick up a verse uh, from uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2. And Paul is saying to Timothy, You then, my son, be strong. I'm going to come back to that word, my son because that's going to be part of what I want to talk about today. Over the last 30 years and previous to that, uh, Pastor Eliafi and Pastor Fear <clears throat> have affected many sons and daughters. And uh, so he's writing to this son 10 years after he mentored him and developed him and released him into the ministry and Timothy's taken up the apostleship role or the senior pastor role of the Ephesian church, the Ephesus church. And uh, that's a great church, and here's Timothy there, being encouraged to stay there and bring some strength into the church. But he's writing to Timothy as his son, and he, he's reflecting on some important things that Timothy needs to take notice of. And that's why I like to talk today about um, uh, taking the legacy of the 30 years and making sure we build on it from now. And it's not just going to be everything that Pastor Eliafi and Pastor Fear are going to do because their ministry, like my ministry has, I've had six churches, I've been uh, freelance ministry to the body of Christ for the last 22 years. Uh, you, 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 you go through phases. And, um, and so we're looking into the future. And one of the things is what have you left? What, what, what seeds have been planted? What trees are growing, what oaks are coming forth, what carry are growing and uh, coming forth, that they will pick up not just the challenge of the next generation, but pick up the essence of the ministry that has been communicated. We are living in a modern age. We have a lot of modern things. But I want to tell you, as far as the scripture is concerned, there's a lot of things that are unchangeable. Styles are, are changeable. Some doctrines which have been created by man and Christianized needed to be adjusted. But the basic essence of the Word of God is unchangeable. And so when we talk about, and I heard Pastor Eliafi speak a couple of weeks ago, the executive and leaders from the Assemblies of God in New Zealand gathered in Auckland, and I was invited to attend as the, uh, uh, the word they used... Uh, the word the general secretary used, we want you there because you're an old guy with wisdom. <laughs> I don't know if I was offended by the old guy thing. Who's old here and not old? Yeah, right, oh, yeah, let's we'll stick that one. But his message, <coughs> his message was authentic Pentecostal dynamics. And I put the word authentic in there because there are a lot of Pentecostal antics. And I'm not into Pentecostal antics. I'm into pe authentic Pentecostal. And, uh, you know, if you're praying for somebody, make sure we've got the goods. 
Let's not go through the exercise of prayer. Let's go through the conveyance of prayer as those who carry the power of attorney in Jesus' name. And this is very challenging for us. So as the new generation is picking up from Pastor Eliafi and Pastor Fear, what they can pick up is not their techniques. How many people get up and walk out of a service and go and have a cup of tea? Uh, I mean, you don't pick up their mythology. You pick up their spirit. You pick up the Jesus they carry. That's what you pick up because it's still got to come through yours and my personality. So let's read this verse that I haven't read that I should have read. Chapter 2 uh, of Second Timothy. You then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. In other words, don't get bent into legalism and don't get into perverted grace of libertarianism. In other words, strong in the grace. And the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses entrust to reliable men who will also be qualified to teach others. What I like here is four generations. Paul, Timothy, reliable men and women, and then others. Generational. And I believe one of the important things that Pastor Iliaf and Fair have uh, contributed, established, invited into the heart of this congregation and this people, and many have moved on, many have been touched around the world. I'm amazed at his travel. I remember I mentioned on the other night, as I went through my list of ten about him, uh, was his um, ability uh, to travel. And um, I remember when inducted him in 1992, I did say in a conversation, Pastor Eliavi, can you just pull back your international travel just, just for a couple of years to establish the church? I'm not sure if he did or he didn't or he modified it or not, but he's always had the travel gene. It's instilled within him. It's deeply embedded in his toes and uh, takes him, and that's good. His discipleship of people, of investing, we heard the testimony here, uh, a man in Hawaii and his wife, and being influenced, and then planting churches, amen. And when you listen to them, you get the sense that they pick something up, more than just methods, more than just mechanics. They picked up the essence and the dynamic that is Jesus being transmitted from our great pastors here today. So I love this text, and so I just want to pick up some things from this text. 30 years on, Paul is writing to Timothy, and the first thing he is doing is he, Paul's future is invested in his spiritual sons. And I, I believe that's very, very important. And if you're a spiritual son, a spiritual daughter, or if you're a grand spiritual son, a grand spirit, I've got grandkids now, and they're growing up. One's just come over from the United Arab Emirates and is uh, going to university in Auckland. <coughs> and um, uh, she had to go through all that MRQ stuff and MIQ and everything like that. And just got into the hostel in Auckland. And then they had an outbreak of a COVID case. And all the students are having a meltdown. Well, she's in the right place at the right time because she had COVID in the Emirates. And uh, she was able to say, well, you can come through it and, and start to encourage them. So uh, she got dumped in the right place at the right time. But I understand that we go through generations. And there, as Paul said to Timothy here, look, Paul, uh, Paul said, look, Timothy, I've invested into you so that you might invest into faithful men so that they might then invest into others. Some years ago, I used to run, or probably about 15 years ago, I think past Iliafi and Affair, attend some of my little uh, getaways with two or three days. We would get away and I'd invite a lot of the pastors that I thought were going to be future leaders. And uh, we would gather over those days and we would just, just invest into them. I remember on one occasion, some of them were all over 50, and they said, you know, what are we going to do now in the church? You know, what about spiritual fathers? And they were talking about spiritual fathers. And I sometimes can be discreetly blunt. I suppose that's a nice way of putting it. And, um, and I just said, 
you guys are 50. What do you want a spiritual father for? I said, you need spiritual peers to encourage one another. For instance, with me, all my spiritual fathers are dead and celebrating in heaven. So I haven't got one. But I have got spiritual peers, people you can talk to and relate to and things like that. And so at that gathering, I said, come on, guys, you know, you've been around long enough and you're ugly enough to stand, to stand up and start to take the responsibility. And let's not underestimate the younger generation. It's one of the things that I carry. I do not underestimate the younger generation. You don't know how good they are. I've got a grandson of 15 and he races cars. He races in the adult off-roaders. And he's been picked up by Honda in a sponsorship. They want to take him to America because he's a good driver. I've sat in the garage with him and watched him pull racing cars to pieces, not normal cars, racing cars. I have no idea what he's doing. I have no idea at all. He's talking to me in a language from Mars. And, uh, and I don't know. And, but he's, he's 15. He has been doing this. He's been racing cars since three I nearly got killed once at his place when he had one of those little buggies he was buzzing around because he didn't worry too much about where to steer it. He just wanted to hit the accelerator. And, uh, and, and, and the, you've got to realize young people today are growing up. And in the church life, they gain a lot more maturity. Like if a person is saved at about 20 and they're suddenly going into the ministry at 26 or something, it's only 16. But if a kid has come through children's church, come through their family, come up through the church for 20 years and they get it into 24, 25, maybe they've done some Bible study, boy, they are maturity beyond their years. I said the other day that when uh, Wayne Hughes was superintendent of the Assemblies of God for 17 years back in, in, in the period when I was on the executive, he came on at the age of 38 as superintendent of the Assemblies of God. And uh, when I first started my first church down in Dunedin over 50 years ago, it's now Nations Church, in 1970, I was, my wife and I, I was 26, she was about 23, when we started our first church. We've got to realize today that the investment that has been made by this couple in spiritual sons and in spiritual grandsons and and, and great-grandsons means that they're not going to be sitting around, but they've got to stand up. And they've got to take the legacy that's been implanted in it and they've got to personalise it. They've got to put it through the filter of am I just mimicking or am I reflecting the qualities that they have given through me? My personality, my giftedness, my way. It took me many years because I came up under what you call significant evangelists, people like Frank Houston and then teachers like Lloyd Averill, um, Cecil Mulvey, David Bridges, Bruce Uren, all these. And sometimes you try to mimic. And, uh, but you, what you've got to do is look for what they carry. Yeah. Yeah. And forget about the frailties and the failures. Look for what they carry in God. And inculcate that into your spirit and into your life as it is important. And that is what this couple have done. That's why Paul could write to Timothy and say to Timothy, to, my, to Timothy, my true son, my true son. Now, he realized that Timothy needed a little bit of a tickle up. And I appreciate the fact that Pastor Iliafi might, from time to time, as I heard on Friday night, might tickle somebody up a bit. Give him a bit of a... <laughs> and uh, probably done very godly and uh, in a, a good way. But um, Paul did say to Timothy in both letters, he said, Timothy, don't be intimidated. Don't be intimidated. Stir up your gift. Fan the flame of your gift. Come on, Timothy. And, and he says, listen, Timothy, when you were prayed for and released into the ministry there uh, when I first took you on the team 10 years ago, um, we prayed for you and prophetic words were given into your life. And, and, and you've been going good for 10 years, but you're forgetting. 
You're forgetting. You're forgetting what was spoken. You're forgetting what was implanted. And I say today that Pastor Eliafi and Fair have spoken. Others have spoken. They've put stuff. If you do not nurture it, if you do not water it, it will wither and fade away. And Paul recognised this with Timothy. He said, Timothy, get your, think back to your prophetic word. Now Paul's prophetic word came to him when he got converted. Ananias visited him after he got converted in Damascus. And there are three things that were given. God spoke to Ananias and says, you've got to go to him, pray with him, because he's, I've called him specially. And he's going to speak to Israel He's going to speak to the Gentiles, and he's going to speak to kings of the Gentile nations. Now, if you look at Paul's life over the years, he constantly kept focused that he would fulfill those prophetic obligations. God has spoken into your life, son, daughter, grandson, granddaughter, great-grandson, great-granddaughter, spiritually, bloodline, doesn't make any difference. Go back and think, what did God Say to me, because you are the carrying of the legacy. Amen. Into the future. He told Timothy not to let anybody look down on him. That's 1 Timothy 4.12. He says, don't let anybody look down on you because you're a young fella. And, um, you know, young fellas have got energy. Young women have got energy. Um, when you've got teenage granddaughters, they wear you out. Uh, they got energy. And uh, they got focus. And they know what they're doing. And they're sharp. And some of them are very quiet. Well, that's okay. Quiet ones have got a lot going on inside. Just need opportunity to, to bring it out. But he says, listen, when young people are coming up, don't look up. One of the things I noticed is the older we get, the older we want a pastor to be. If you're 90 here, you feel a pastor's young at 65. <laughs> Paul was dead at 63, and Jesus was dead at 33. So if you go back to the New Testament, you, you ain't going to get one. All right. Um, <laughs> you've, got, you've got them growing up, and... Um, and we've got to realize that God is speaking to our sons and daughters. Sure, they need discipling. Sure, they need maturity. Sure, they need to be covered so they're not exposed to pressures and temptations that they're not used to. That's all part of what the body of Christ. But we must allow them to sprout forth. We must allow them to follow what God is speaking with guidance and direction. Amen. Uh, Paul also said to Timothy that he was to equip himself in the word of God. And if you read 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy, you'll find a long, long shopping list there of all sorts of rubbish that the church was facing. I'll just read out a few. It was like a tsunami. False doctrines, myths, meaningless talks, old wives' tales. That's what it says in NIV. Uh, controversies and quarrels and godless chatter. Now, if you read through the book, two books, you'll find Paul is saying to Timothy, Timothy, sharpen yourself up because that world you're in is changing. And what this couple have invested in many is not to say, hey, listen, we're equipping you so that you will minister in the environment that we had 30 years ago. Paul is writing to Timothy and saying, since the church was established at Ephesus under that evangelistic move, you are now many years down the line 12 years down the line, and things are changing. So sharpen up, younger generation, because you're facing changes. But he is telling him not to adapt to the changes, but to bring the message that he carries that Paul had taught him. Amen. And so that is very, very important. Another thing here, and I'm just going through them quickly, is Paul wanted Timothy to ensure that he maintained the DNA of evangelism. He said, Timothy, do the work of an evangelist. Doesn't matter what your gifting is. We're going to be talking about to people about Jesus. We're going to be sharing Jesus. It's not complicated. If you've got a faith, got an experience, share that. I was on the streets of Wellington witnessing to people on the streets in the early hours of the morning in 1966. 
And I used to lead a team called the Midnight Rescue Crusade, where we went out to all the nightclubs and went out to all the unsavory places that'll cover it, and went to wherever hell it was, we were there. I came from hell, so I was quite comfortable to be saved and walking in hell, and to share Jesus with people. And I stopped the guy on the street, and I said to him, you know, uh, <clears throat> Uh, are you interested in spiritual things? Because we had learned the book, the little book, four ways, questions to ask when you're leading people to the Lord. First question was, are you interested in spiritual things? Whether they say yes or no, it didn't matter. He just went on to the second question. And so, uh, so we, I asked this guy on the street, are you interested in spiritual things? And he said, um, he said, uh, uh, do you believe what you're peddling? And I said, yes. He said, well, if you did, you would speak it out of your heart experience and not use a formula. A guy just stopped me up the road and asked me the same question. Good day, and off he walked. <laughs> so I'm s s sitting there on the street having taught the whole team how to use the four spiritual rules to lead a person to the Lord. So we went back and we changed it. So we got people to think about their conversion experience. Think about what Christ had done so that you could share it out of your life. And you do that. And I said to some leaders the other day, I said, the issue is not witnessing to people. The issue is socializing and talking to people. And as you talk to people, the conversation somewhere along the line is going to most likely twist so you can bring the gospel in. You don't have to go out with the Bible loaded in a 12-gauge shotgun <laughs> and walk up to them and put it right up their nostril and say, I am here to blow your brain with a word of God. No, 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 no. You know, you carry the power, you carry the conviction, you can pray for people. I, I pray for people anywhere, anytime, any place. And, uh, you know, if I feel it's appropriate. If it's not appropriate, he'll probably smack me around the head, which I try to avoid because I smack my own head well enough myself. I fell down a cliff at Christmas time and banged it quite well. And uh, so you've got to get the gospel. Going to another point, second point, Paul made it his priority to ensure the church was protected from all the stuff that's invading the church. Young people, sons, daughters, grandsons, granddaughters of this couple, protect the church. Speak well. It's not perfect. I haven't gone into a perfect church yet. I've gone into some churches more perfect than others, but I have never gone into a perfect one. Speak well of your pastors. Speak well of your leaders. Don't fall into that trap that I said a few moments ago that Paul told Timothy to address. False doctrines, myths, meaningless talk, controversies, you know, um, godless chatter. One thing I can absolutely say that I've learned from Pastor Iliafi, he's the expert of brevity. When he speaks, he's saying something. You know, it's good. I just talk, you know. But what he's saying is if you're not saying anything constructive, why throw out a lot of pointless rubbish? Disciples. Get focused. Get your mind focused. Get clear in your thinking. doesn't mean you stop talking, but it means try to think about what you're saying. I shared the other day, I was preaching on Revelation way back in one of my earlier churches, third church, and I was preaching one night on Revelation. I was doing the futurist approach, and I was preaching it there with all the fervor that one can preach because the point is, if your point is weak, shout. And so I'm preaching with all the fervor. <laughs> on Revelation, and then suddenly I come to the conclusion as I'm preaching, I have a conversation with myself and I say, what the heck are you preaching this for? I'm still preaching, of course. And I came to the conclusion I needed to give a bit more focus and attention as to what I believed. And we must do that if we are meant to carry the legacy to the next generation. Just the last point before I close today. And uh, I, uh, I, I see that Paul... I did an exercise the other day. I got a little concerned that our Pentecostal church is drifting away from our eternal hope 
and the second coming of Jesus. So I did an exercise. I went in <clears throat> through the New Testament. I left out the Gospels because it's obvious Jesus spoke in some way prophetically about the future. And I, I left out Revelation because that's subject to all sorts of uh, end time interpretation and some of it's good and some of it's really weird and some of it is unbelievable. But, um, but so I went through all the other epistles in the New Testament and only three did not have any reference to uh, eternal hope or the second coming of Jesus. That was Philemon and third, uh, second John and third John. All the rest had a reference about the second coming of Jesus in some way. And uh, so I read through them all and I, I noted them and I'm talking about texts and there were about 69 texts and some of them had what, 20, 30, like 1 Corinthians 15, that's a large text. So I had 69 texts through them all. So I came to the conclusion that even though Paul preached on many other subjects, his goal, his aim was the future hope and the second coming of Jesus Christ. And so I became convinced of that. And so I just looked at it here again with the Apostle Paul. And when he spoke to Timothy and he was saying to him, look, Timothy, uh, keep the hope and the focus of the end time. He says, keep the command, and the command was that you fight the good fight of faith. Keep this command without spot or blame until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now I understand there are a lot of opinions. I've studied them all as uh, best I can and all the variables of the opinions, you know, preterist, partial, preterist, historicist, futurist, allegorical, idealistic, spiritual. I've gone through them all and I've had a bath with them and, uh, and then I have went and shouted all the way. Um, th there are some truths in each of them but the fundamental truth is Jesus is coming again. If you want to figure out when, well, go and have fun. Um, back in the 80s, he was coming in 1988. Then he was coming in 2000. Then he was coming in something else. I have no idea where he's coming. He's going to come as the thief and the knife, but with the church, we can be ready. We don't know the times, but we can be ready. And so how do I live? I live as if Jesus is never coming. I plan as if he's never coming. I'll encourage my children, my grandchildren, and so as if he's never coming. But I will live and focus as if he's coming tonight. And I believe it's a good approach. Amen. Let's not, as Paul said to Timothy, and I say to young disciples here today, you're not just living as many preachers have said over, you know, we've got to preach about living in this world. Of course we do. Absolutely. Read all Paul's epistles. It's how to live. It's how to focus. It's how to stay strong. It's how to build the church. It's how to bless families. It's how to look after widows. It's how to live pure. It's how to pray for governments. It's how to da da da. It's all there. But running through it all is we're looking for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and what he has in the future. And that's you. You've got my future bit just there. All right? I'm not going to give you all the stuff. Some of you are already having a hernia. Um, he's coming, and there's a future. All right. And his purpose and his plan. Hallelujah. And so my encouragement today, and it's been a privilege to be here, is that <clears throat> Paul, 30 years uh, after his conversion, after discipling Timothy for 10 years, he's thinking about the future. He's starting to feel his, his time is going to change. And in my book, I talk about six phases of Paul's life. And the last phase became his greater phase. Um, let's go 60 to 90, if you don't offend anybody. All right. Um, but uh, the greatest phase. Still investing. He invested more time and energy into his disciples and into other leaders in his latter phase than he did in his earlier ministry, intensive ministry phase. And so young people who have benefited, older people, I saw one of the fellows up here, he had a white beard, and he's talking to his father, Eliafi. And uh, I thought, he looks old. He looks young. Please don't be offended by what I just said there. <laughs> and uh, so 30 years and uh, investing 
So people who have been blessed, enriched, enriched, if you're online somewhere around the country, around the world, if you're in the hall next door, if you have been enriched, amen, stir up your gift, stir up your focus, get into the word of God, throw out intimidation, don't let your age stop you, stand up and carry the legacy into the future. Could we all stand as I just uh, pray a quick prayer and then I'm going to hand it over to Ben. <clears throat> Amen. Thank you. Father, there are young folk here. There are children here today and you're touching their hearts. Maybe they don't <clears throat> initially grasp everything, but they grasp one thing. God, you love them, you care for them, and you've got a future for them. A lot of people out there are, are doom and gloom. And Father, we are living in doom and gloom in a sense because Jesus, you predicted that's the nature of the world. But you said you've got a glorious church. You've got a church that's going to grow. It's a church that's going to be transformed uh, through the hearts and lives of every individual that attend. And that church is going to stand up in these days. And that church, amen, is going to raise up new generations. And those new generations are going to participate of the DNA, amen, of the word of God that has been transmitted through godly men and godly women like Pastor Eliafi and Pastor Fear. And we thank you for everything they are invested. Let's not treat it lightly. Let's take it and let's replicate it and let's imitate it in the sense of reflecting the quality of what they have imparted into us so that this the next generation, dear God, shall have greater impact, amen, because there'll be more carrying what one or two people carried. So we ask you to bless us in Jesus' name. We commit ourselves afresh to you on this day of celebration, reflecting to the past but projecting to the future in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen, amen. amen.
we just want to present you with this uh, gift as our appreciation for your incredible 30 years. We pray God's blessing upon you both and to the next 30 years that God has in store for you. Oh, God bless you. My duties are done, so I'm going to now hand over to our senior pastor. He can take the pul pulpit for the first time this weekend. Morning. How are you? This is my wife, the better looking half of our family, and the mother and grandmother of our children and great-grandmother. So she's going to say something. <laughs> well, it has been a really, um, we arrived on the 15th of um, January, 1992. And when it was um, said that it's been 30 years, I kind of look at it, I thought, oh wow, what have we been, what, what have you been doing in the 30 years? And it's amazing how that if somebody said, oh, you're going to be here for 30 years. So you look at it 30 years and say, oh, that's a long time. But then now we're standing at 30 years looking back, thinking, oh, what a short time. The, the different perspective of 30 years from the beginning to, the, to today, or from today to the beginning, it's, it kind of gives you... The, um, the, the, the heart and the thought, how did we do that? Then I know, if it wasn't with God, we will not be here in 30 years. And also, if it wasn't with the church, The faithful people in Faith City Church, the Faith Community Church, Faith City Church, if it wasn't for you, this celebration is not just for us. It's just for all of us. And Yafi and I and the family and the children, and also with all our Faith City Church members who journey with us from day one to today. This celebration is about us. It's not just about the two of us. It's all of us. Those who have gone home to be with the Lord. Those who have shifted to another locations. And those who have gone to other churches. This is about us. Looking back and, and, and we can, we, all we can say is that it is the faithfulness of God. It is the goodness of God. It is the love of God that has brought us here today and that I want to celebrate you as well and I just want to thank you Faith City Church so many friends so many colleagues so many mothers so many fathers so many brothers and sisters so many children thank you for helping us your support your prayers your commitment you're trusting in us and your times that you honor us, that helped us to be steady and still keep falling in love with you, Faith City Church, and still keep falling in love with Jesus. And thank you so much for joining in with us, trusting us, and committing to the vision that God has given to us as a church and all I want to say, to God be the glory forever and ever. And let's look forward to another 30 years, whether we're going to be here in the next 30 years, but we're going to look forward to a greater things that God has in store for us. God bless. Yeah. 
Amen. You can sit down now so I can say something. We're, we're trying to... Uh, We're trying to stagger things so that the kids can have the meals ready when you get up. <laughs> 30 years ago, Kim came to induct us. And uh, I was, I think, about 30. Uh, I, was, I was 30 plus. <laughs> But one of the things he said to us, and it just stuck with me all this time, and I've been trying to be faithful like uh, Timothy to Paul. He said to me, there are many fads, there are many tangents, whatever you do, preach the Bible. Yeah. Yeah. And I have endeavored to preach the Bible from that day to this. And I still remember that. Thank you for being part of our journey, being part of our lives. Uh, we appreciate you and Joe very, very much. Probably far more than you up will ever know. But uh, you're a father in the faith, in the country, and bring stability to the church, not just the Assemblies of God. I was at a missions conference. They were talking about relaunching the canoe of missions. And then uh, somebody sat down with Pastor Kim and talked about missions. And he said to me, that's not a canoe. That's a 747. That man is a 747 for missions. Uh, we traveled quite a bit. And he said to me to curb it. So I curb it for seven months. Uh, we came to the church. And uh, the church uh, was, uh, the leadership said, uh, we didn't ask God for a missionary, we asked God for a pastor. And I said to the leadership, unfortunately, God send you a missionary. And uh, I'll commit our, our lives to the church, will not do any travel outside of the church for seven months, and we never did. And after seven months, uh, we started to travel again, so I heeded your word. Uh, for seven months, yeah, that, that's... <laughs> But uh, we launch uh, the, the, the work in the Solomon Islands and, and we send uh, the first building team in, from Mangaweka. The, the, the Solomon Island uh, Bible College was almost virtually built from Mangaweka, from one of the smallest churches in the country numerically. And uh, I remember Kim coming to me and he said, I want you to go to the Solomon Islands. And I said, what for? Uh, it's enough that I send my people, send money over there. What, what do you want me to go to the Solomon Islands for? You know what he said? Because I want you too. I said, okay. <laughs> and uh, we went. Uh, he said, well, that's right. He said, I'm not asking you to go. I'm telling you to get on the plane. I said, okay. So I, I obeyed then too. Uh, o obedience is better than sacrifice, you know. <laughs> and when I got there, I realized the wisdom of why he wanted me to go. Now, if you're a Solomon Island, Islander and you're listening to this video, you will understand this too. Because to the Solomon Islander, God is a white man. And God will move through a white man and will not move through a black man. And then I turned up and, they, and I got introduced and Graham, Graham uh, Davison said, This is Tony, Tony Marshall's pastor. This is Peter, Peter's pastor. This is uh, uh, Bob and Julie's pastor. And they looked at me and they said, you pastor Europeans? I said, yes. They laughed. They talked among each other. And then they asked again, you pastor Europeans? I said, yes. They laughed again. They talked to each other. And then they said, you pastor Europeans? I said, yes. And then they said, how do you pastor Europeans? I said, the same way you pastor Solomon Islanders. God is not a respecter of men. And... It, it birthed something in their hearts and it birthed something that was authentic and real and good. And uh, so thank you very much for telling me what to do and not asking me what to do. <laughs> uh, Soren Kierkegaard said this, we look back to understand, but we live forward. Looking back at 30 years, it's been a great journey and 
Fia has already mentioned, we've, we've sent so many of our older generation to heaven. I can stand here and rename them and, and you miss them, some of you who know them. But we have an investment in heaven. People that have prayed for us to come through, they've gone home and we are going to see them again. But this is where we are. We are custodians of what God has given to us now. We were architects, uh, we're going to be architects of tomorrow, but we are custodians of what God has given to us. And that's a verse I quote quite often. God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us. When we came to uh, Wanganui, we just came, uh, our little... Uh, uh, car <laughs> and uh, with just one son and I remember what Jacob said to God I crossed this river over 20 years ago the only thing I had was a stick now I'm crossing the same river again over 20 years later and I have got two companies that's the faithfulness of God I'm blessed to have Tongan children and Fijian children and uh, South African children and Zimbabwean. I've got black grandchildren and white and brown and I've got Maori grandchildren. It's, it's a f phenomenal heritage and we are blessed. And as Fia said, this is not just about us. It's about all of us. And uh, it's just lovely. She said to me, we're going to sing a song. I said, what song do you want to sing? What song do you want to sing? <laughs> We're going to sing a song. That's how our family is very colorful. I don't, we'll, we'll, just, we'll just, just follow us. <laughs> I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold I'd rather be His than riches untold I'd rather have Jesus than houses or land I'd rather be by his nail pierced hands than to be the king of a vast domain or be held in sin's dread sway I'd rather have Jesus than anything this world affords today than to be the king of a vast domain or be held in sin's dread sway I'd rather have Jesus than anything this world affords today.